Hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for the webinar today. My name is Jessica Unger, and I'm the Emergency Programs Coordinator at the Foundation of the American Institute for Conservation. We're so pleased to be able to offer today's program as a part of a webinar series that addresses the needs of Alliance for Response Communities and other cooperative disaster networks nationwide. These programs are made possible through the generous support of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'm so glad that uh, I see so many familiar names in the participant list and that many of you were able to join us for past sessions in this six-part webinar series. Uh, and of course, today is the, the final program of that series, and we're uh, really looking forward to uh, what promises to be a great presentation. Before we dive into the formal presentation today, a couple of brief technical notes. On your screen, you'll see several boxes, including one labeled chat on the left side of your screen, one labeled web links, and one labeled files on the bottom. Use the chat box to say hello, ask questions, and share information. If you post a question, you'll receive a response either from me or my colleague, Tiffany Emig. Any questions will be noted, collected, and then I will ask them of our presenter. To use the web links box, just click on a link that you want to see and highlight it in blue, then click on the Browse To button to go to that site. Likewise, in the Files box, click on the file you want to download, highlight it in blue, and then hit the Download File button. If you've missed a past program in this series, don't fret. We have been recording all of the programs and hosting them on AIC's YouTube channel, and you can access that via the web links box below. Uh, we currently have all of the other sessions up in the YouTube channel, and we'll aim to have today's up before the end of the week. Um, so please do uh, use that as a reference if you'd like to go back and see any programs that you might have missed or uh, revisit some of the past topics. For those who aren't familiar with the Alliance for Response initiative, I just wanted to give a bit of context about the history and goals of the program. Alliance for Response began almost 15 years ago with a key mission in mind, to help communities more effectively protect their cultural and historic resources. The immediate objectives are to, one, build relationships, initiating an ongoing dialogue between cultural institutions and emergency managers and first responders. Two, to educate cultural heritage and emergency management professionals, working to raise awareness of the need to protect cultural and historic resources within communities, encouraging disaster planning and mitigation at archives, historic sites, libraries, and museums. And three, to develop strong ongoing networks to facilitate effective local response. The topics that we've covered in this series have tried to address uh, all three of these goals, some of them hitting on multiple goals at once. Uh, today's program, I think, in particular, really gets at this final goal of developing these strong, ongoing networks um, that will be able to uh, effectively uh, respond to local events. And um, as many of you who are involved with Alliance for Response are aware, the need for funding to support those project goals is key to that mission. So uh, we hope that today's session will help inspire and strengthen your networks moving forward. Many of you might be familiar with Alliance for Response as an initiative of heritage preservation, but in May of 2015, heritage preservation unfortunately closed its doors. Uh, however, fortunately, at that time, many of its programs transferred to the foundation of the American Institute for Conservation. Alliance for Response and other emergency initiatives at heritage preservation joined forces with the emergency initiatives currently underway at FAIC, including the National Heritage Responders, formerly known as AIC CERT, a team of trained collections care professionals who can provide on-the-ground support for impact to cultural heritage institutions. You can find out more information about the National Alliance for Response Initiative and the existing networks by visiting our website at heritageemergency.org backslash AFR. Again, you can access that link by clicking on the box below. Before I turn things over, we just wanted to get a quick sense of who is on the webinar today. Uh, to that end, I have several poll questions and if you've been on programs before, you're familiar with these. Uh, first up, how many of you are currently involved with an AFR network? Great, so it looks like about two-thirds are, around a third aren't, the shifting a little bit. Um, perhaps more are than not, um, but that's great. Thank you all. Okay, for those who are involved with AFR, 
do you know of anyone from a network outside of your own region? So how much connection is happening between the current AFR networks? Great, similar responses to last or the past program. So um, a, a small majority of you are in contact with each other. We're hoping to continue those connections. Great, thank you. And then finally, if you're uh, joining us from within the US, uh, we're curious to know what region you're from. So um, note that these are slightly different regions than some of the earlier sessions. So um, find your state to indicate which region you're from. Great. As always, we're seeing a lot of um, representation from the Mid-Atlantic and Southeast. Great. Thank you all. Uh, again, we really appreciate that. Um, it's, it's helpful for, for all of us to know who's on the, the session, but especially for our presenters to know who they're talking to. So I really appreciate that. So today, we're incredibly fortunate to be joined by um, our wonderful presenter, Ellen Gorham. For the last five years, Ellen has served as the manager of disaster fundraising for the American Red Cross. In this role, Ellen is responsible for leading fundraising in response to large domestic international disasters to large domestic, international, and disasters across the organization, as well as the application of fundraising policies, regulations, and disaster statistics. During her tenure, she has led fund fundraising campaigns for Hurricane Matthew, the Louisiana floods, Superstorm Sandy, the Nepal earthquake, and dozens of other disasters, helping the organization raise more than $500 million in response. Ellen has nearly 15 years of fundraising experience. Prior to the Red Cross, she was a senior consultant with CCS Fundraising. Here she led major fundraising efforts for the Maryland Hospital Association and the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. Ellen also directed field operations for two U.S. congressional campaigns and was a World Teach volunteer in Hunan Province, China. When not being on call for disasters, Ellen enjoys spending time with her family and friends, outdoor sports, cooking gourmet dinners, going to concerts, and watching her favorite sports teams, UNC Tar Heels and San Francisco 49ers. Ellen received an MPA from the Maxwell School at Syracuse University and a BA in journalism from UNC Chapel Hill. She, her husband Chris, and one and a half year old daughter reside in Silver Spring, Maryland. With that, I will turn things over to Ellen and um, thank you so much for your time today, Ellen. Thank you, Jessica. That was a very kind introduction. And hello to everyone out there. I hope everyone can hear me well enough, although we did some volume testing before I started. Um, but I'm here to just talk about what, what I do, and I'm hoping that that will translate and help, help you all out in the future. Um, so here's just our agenda today. We've got um, between 30 minutes and 45 minutes of a presentation. I think it will depend on um, how many questions you might want to ask as we go along or even at the end of the presentation. I'm going to spend a little time at first um, just giving you a background of the American Red Cross. I would imagine many of you are familiar with the organization, but I'm going to go into just a little bit more detail, uh, particularly around our fundraising and how we're set up, because I think that translates into a lot of what we eventually do and how we do it. Um, then I'm going to talk about disaster fundraising and what disaster fundraising means. Um, that is when uh, it's not just that our fundraising is a disaster, but um, when large disasters happen either here in the U.S. or in other parts of the world, how we respond as an organization and work to fulfill our mission by raising dollars um, to help those in need by those disasters. Um, and then I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about how we do this by segment. And I think this might be the longest part of the presentation. Um, again, going into uh, detail on our, our major gifts and individual giving, on how we do it in the corporate space, on how we do it in what we call our core channels, which are um, donors who give less than $2,500. And um, we usually assign them into email and um, our direct mail programs, et cetera. And then last but not least, we'll touch on stewardship because that is very important. So I'm going to dive right in, and um, I hope you enjoy the presentation. And again, I hope it's helpful. 
So our mission, um, we just updated our mission statement about three years ago. But here it is, plain and simple. We help people, um, and we try to pre prevent and alleviate um, what could potentially be human suffering. And the American Red Cross is part of the global Red Cross movement. Every, um, most every country around the world has their own national Red Cross or Red Crescent Society. And we are one of many of those organizations and one of the strongest. And our services are straightforward. I'm sure you're well aware of what we do in times of disaster. And you're pretty familiar with um, our blood services. That makes up a large chunk of our organization. Um, and again, the wonderful volunteers who give, give blood. We provide um, around 40% of this country's blood supply, uh, as well as platelets, plasma, and other blood products. And then you're also pretty familiar with our, what we call preparedness, health, and safety services, but that would be CPR and lifeguarding and those courses that really do um, help save lives. And then we have our international services component of the American Red Cross, and um, it's a smaller portion of, of what we do, even though, of course, the world is, is um, very large. But we focus in two areas now. Um, the biggest is in disaster preparedness, so we partner with a number of countries around the world. And then we also um, have a small health component, and that is our measles initiative. We're part of a um, UNICEF and UN Foundation project that aims to eliminate measles um, around the world, and so we, we support that initiative. And then the last is our service to the armed forces. And our goal here is to support military families through emergency communication efforts, through our holiday Mail for Heroes program, and through other projects that directly um, support our military and our military families. So those are a rundown of the five services that this American Red Cross provides. And then this is just a snapshot of how the American Red Cross um, impacts others. 180 times a day, our uh, workers, 90% of whom are volunteers, are helping a family affected by a disaster. You all are familiar with how we help after large disasters, but every day we're helping with home fires across the country, and we respond to nearly 64,000 disasters each year, providing support um, locally and then we really ramp up when a large disaster happens. Um, in fact, it's been quite busy over the weekend. Uh, we have, and, and now we continue to help after those uh, deadly tornadoes out in um, Georgia, Mississippi, and other parts of the southeast. And then again, another snapshot of some other figures. OK, so now jumping into fundraising. Um, we have, as an organization, um, we have, let's see, around 400 fundraisers across the country, and we have an annual fundraising goal of approximately $500 million. And this is how we, we see some of the revenue come in by those lines of service I showed you. Um, so most of it comes in fairly, fairly general, and then the orange shows um, that we raise in non-disaster times, a good amount through disaster relief. And then um, we usually raise additional. That word episodic um, is when we have a larger disaster and it's restricted to those larger disaster events. And then you'll see the same through international, how that comes in. And a portion also goes towards the uh, specific disaster at hand. So that's really how, how it comes. And you can see how uh, raising around disasters is pretty important. That orange slice of the pie increases based on, um, on the number of disasters that we have each year. And in fact, FY15 for us, so that was nearly a year and a half ago, was actually a fairly slow disaster year. And then it really ramped up in our fiscal year, 16, and, and we're halfway through 17 now. and it's been been pretty nuts, I can tell you that. 
And then this also, this chart just will show you the variance in some of those disasters um, and how much uh, we are not necessarily dependent, but on those large disasters, but how much our revenue can fluctuate based on large events. So you've got, of course, 9-11. Um, then you have um, that Southeast Asian tsunami more than 10 years ago, Hurricane Katrina, Haiti, Japan, Hurricane Sandy. And then our FY16 and 17 um, will likely be a little higher, too, because of recent events like the Louisiana floods. OK, any, any questions so far? And if you have them, I believe, Jessica, um, you're welcome to send them to the chat box if you want. Yes, I will echo Ellen right, on that. Um, please, please do drop them in the chat box. Nothing yet, though. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so we are, we used to be not one organization. Now we are one 501c3. Um, up until a few years ago, we had several hundred different chapters with varied programs across the country. And several hundred different chapters meant that we had several, you know, dozens of different ways of fundraising. And now we've, um, we have our headquarters in Washington, D.C., and we have our field chapters across the country. Um, we have 60 regions, and we have um, 67, I'm sorry, 60 regions, and they are part of seven different divisions. And this map doesn't physically show, but this also includes Puerto Rico, Hawaii, um, our American Samoa, and islands in the Pacific, as well as, uh, of course, Alaska. So seven different divisions, and um, the fundraising is done in the field. At national headquarters, we serve as support to the field. So we're providing them um, the tools, the guidance, and really the overall strategy, and they are, are there to implement it. And then each of those divisions has their own kind of fundraising vice president who's overseeing some of the metrics. And it's um, in a way, it's almost like a, a sales mentality of, of fundraising. But of course, that relationship management is so, so important to us. And then this is our small unit and what um, I help manage. We do have a national chief development officer, and I report directly to him. And he also oversees those fundraising presidents that are in the field, uh, as well as all the, the fundraisers I mentioned who are, are helping us. And then my small, we call ourselves a small and mighty team. Um, but I, I have three employees who are fantastic. One um, leads international and one, and, and really two oversee domestic. And that's the bulk of our work is really standing up when big disasters happen and making sure our field has what they need. And these are the three um, areas that my team um, is responsible for. And we break it up similar to how our disaster program and our international program um, define their, their jobs. They help. Um, we help fundraisers prepare, respond, and recover from big disasters. And so by prepare, we make sure that each of those 60 regions out in the country have what's called a disaster fundraising action plan. And I'll go into more detail of what that is uh, later. We provide training specifically for them to, to know how to ramp up and rev up when a big disaster happens. And then um, just general guidance throughout the year on how to solicit for donations for either international or domestic um, disasters and those programs. And then the response part um, keeps us very busy. And we're in charge of the guidance and the strategy. So when a big disaster happens, um, one thing I like to point out is we work with our senior leadership to, to decide, are we going to have a specific designation or, or event code for a disaster? Or are we not? Because our goal really is to raise more general dollars 
um, in response to a disaster, which are absolutely going to help with that disaster, but they can also help with our other um, program work around disasters that, that happen and those 64 other thousand disasters I mentioned. Um, we also help just make sure that when a disaster happens, the impacted disasters, or, or I'm sorry, the impacted areas and the impacted fundraisers have the resources that they need because um, the first two calls that happen um, when a disaster happens to a local Red Cross, and, and we'll use um, this weekend's tornadoes as an example, uh, the first one being in, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, the first people calling are saying, okay, I need help, how do I get help? Or they're calling to say, how can I give help? How can I make my donation? Um, and we've got to be ready to respond. And then um, by recovery, we, we work and coordinate on stewarding and providing the reporting that's needed, both from a financial and programmatic side. And we work very closely with um, our disaster teams and our international teams on that, as well as finance. And then conducting um, after action reviews with our fundraisers. How can we get better? This just happened. What can we do better next time? And documenting that so that we can, again, continue to improve and continue to provide the best possible service um, to our donors, to our partners, to, to other fundraising prospects when that disaster happens. Because it all happens fast and furious. So I like to show this to give, oops, to give a better example of what it really means to be in, in, in crazy fundraising mode. Um, these are a couple of different tactics that all come about um, when a, a big event or emergency happens. And um, our goal is to make sure that these are organized and kind of set up in a certain timeline so that um, you don't get caught in the fog and the haze of having too many things come at you at once and, and you stall. Um, because when you do stall, that means that you're not able to um, do your, your main job, which is to be talking with, with donors and prioritizing um, funding opportunities so that we can raise what's needed for the disaster at hand. And so those fundraising action plans I talked about have this, these items and others listed and how to go about um, updating them or, or tracking them when that disaster happens. And this is just a slide to kind of reflect on um, the objective of, of our organization and others when a disaster happens um, that are in this humanitarian space. Um, one, our, our objective is first to help cover the cost of the disaster response and, and kind of our portion of what that is. Um, each of our disasters, when they happen in the U.S., um, has a number associated it, with it, um, and it really depends on the amount of homes impacted and the amount of service that, that is needed by the Red Cross for those impacted um, individuals and families. Internationally, it's a bit of a different story um, because, like I mentioned, we have um, dozens of other very strong and, and less strong um, national Red Cross societies around the world. And so the response and the need from a country like Japan is going to be very different from, a, um, from a Nepal or from even the Philippines. And um, so it really depends on where the disaster happens and what's needed. Uh, and we have to wait on that before we can um, raise money and send it to that that organization. Um, the American Red Cross as a whole does not and has not asked for help from other um, national Red Cross societies since I believe Katrina and even then we didn't necessarily ask for direct support because we are able as an organization and as a country to, to supply what's needed. But the second um, that deadly earthquake in Nepal happened, the National Society said, we're going to need help. We can't do this alone. There are just too many casualties, too many needs. And so we were able to um, 
set up fundraising fairly quickly. For that big Japanese tsunami that happened um, a number of years ago, or back in 2011, and this was before I was with the organization, um, Japan, as a strong country, uh, society said, you know what, we're good. We have what we need to respond. Even though this is a tragic and terrible event, we have what's needed. And we ended up um, working out an agreement with Japan because we had so much donor interest that um, we were able to raise money for that event to support it, but it just took a little longer to um, make that decision and, and get it get it to them. And you know, it's been a, a very good relationship since then, and we've been able to spend what's seated. All right, so back to this slide. Cover the cost. And then, like I mentioned earlier, we want to raise additional unrestricted um, funds as we can to support the work that we do every day while our, our mission and, our, um, and the moment and what we do is in um, the public's eye. And then as we can, um, following a big event, we, like many organizations, we want to expand our donor base, base, turn those new donors as we can into annual sustaining donors. I'm not sure if this is showing up. It's not showing up in mine, but this was, um, Jessica, can you see the, the visual in this? Uh, well, no, I can't. Let me see if I can, it. let me see if I can get the, the PowerPoint um, uploaded in another form, but I don't see it, sorry. Okay. Yeah, and it's really okay if this is the only one that's not gonna, gonna show up. Um, but this was just a visual of how my small team intersects with the whole organization when the disaster strikes to coordinate fundraising. Because we've got a big organization and we've got a lot going on. And so this showed my team as the hub. And then we have field fundraisers, we have marketing, we have um, advertising, we have our programmatic teams, either um, disaster services or international services, and we have finance. And we have um, really most all parts of the organization um, because when, when it happens, we have a number of activities to do, and I'll go into more, more detail on that. Um, so what's part of those disaster fundraising action plans? We work with our fundraisers, and this is something I think that would be beneficial to you all. Um, again, how do you prepare for the next kind of large response-like event with your organization? where you've got a short window of fundraising opportunity um, and, and the attention may be on your organization, um, how can you do it successfully? And so we've got, um, we ask our fundraisers to build their um, disaster list of prospects and donors ahead of a disaster, have those ready to go. Um, then we look at uh, our, our portfolio management system that we use is Salesforce. And so they load those lists into it. Um, before, when we had Razor's Edge, they did a similar thing. Um, we talk about who's going to do what, because there are a lot of actual different jobs or short-term jobs that come up when, um, when a disaster happens. And Jessica, I see that you pulled the picture up. At least it's showing up on my slide. Yes, do you want me to bring that over for others to see? Yeah, sure. We'll only keep it up for, you know, five seconds. This is what I was referring to. Oh, I miss communications. I knew I was missing someone. Um, making sure we have the right messaging and the right fundraising messaging across the organization. And consumer fundraising is our, um, I mentioned the core donor, again, online, email, um, paid search, uh, it, our crowd rise or third party pages that we have, text to donate, etc. Thanks, Jessica. I think that's all we need. So back to preparing before a disaster. Um, who's doing what? Like I said, the staffing. There's some extra roles that, that happen with us. Um, telethons, third party fundraisers, in-kind donations can be um, can take up a lot of a lot of time. People want to give stuff, so we ask that each of our regions assign fundraisers extra kind of jobs 
um, as they can or work with volunteers and other staff to assign those jobs to them uh, or roles so that they can do that and are ready to do that when a disaster happens. And then before a disaster, how are you going to process those extra donations? How are you going to actually report on what's coming in? Um, what's your acknowledgement system? We're all on one system at the Red Cross, but still there are many questions and little, tack little things that can bear and bog you down um, as it relates to accepting donations and processing them correctly uh, to figure out ahead of a disaster. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next slide. And um, just some more on, on this fundraising action plan. It's about 10 pages. Um, regions are able to update it as they like, but uh, it has those additional things like timetables. What are you going to do at our uh, day one? What's your priority for day two? Uh, so they don't just jump right into in-kind donations and worry about getting lunch for the volunteers, um, which is important but maybe they should prioritize on reaching out to the donor, another one of their donors in their portfolio and asking or requesting a $10,000 donation because we know this disaster is going to cost the Red Cross a um, you know, million dollars. So trying to refocus and, and pri prioritize is a big thing. And then it has the different contracts that we use, and it even has contingency plans. What happens, for example, um, we had a tornado that impacted one of our chapter buildings and damaged it, um, and so people couldn't physically come into that building. Do you have your list of donors ready and even printed or on a jump drive um, and contact information that you have that may not be at your office computer if you have a desktop? Things like that. All right. So the disaster strikes, and I hope it's not, this is showing a, a large wildfire. It almost looked like a volcano. Um, sometimes we've got a little time before disasters, but when we know that hurricane is coming, we don't know exactly where, and they tend to move around a little bit. But at least we have a few days' notice. Um, but for the majority of our disasters, uh, like, like tornadoes, like an earthquake especially, even wildfires, um, the disaster just happens really quickly, and you don't have time to prepare, or you should have. Um, and it usually doesn't happen at a convenient time, like a Monday afternoon or Tuesday afternoon. It's going to happen on late on a Friday night on a holiday weekend. <laughs> so the disaster happens. We're asking the impacted regions to activate their fundraising action plan. And then we're going to try to get information as quickly as we can. Um, what is this? the size and scope of this, the current disaster, um, how much do we think it's going to cost, how long is the response going to go on. Um, sometimes it can, we can quickly get this information, or we just know it's going to be big, or it's getting a lot of media attention. Or sometimes the disaster is a slow building flood, and it's in an area of the country that um, maybe is, could be more rural. Um, it's not on anything but the local news, but it's going to impact ten, hundreds, maybe, if not thousands, of homes. We're going to have a very different fundraising strategy than if it's all over the news and um, we're getting calls uh, unannounced, left and, left and right. And then we're going to build our, our fundraising campaign, kind of like a mini capital campaign, um, to raise X amount of dollars within a certain week, two week, even four week time frame. And then this is a little bit more about what my team does to support and how this directly will help the field because we want them out um, talking to talking to donors and working with their board members and, and working with their companies and not worrying about um, some of the back end stuff, not worrying about sitting and writing a case statement. We will do that for them. Um, so we're, we're sending them out regular information um, in an email at least daily. We're working on that fundraising strategy, like I said, so that they know what to see. And across the organization, we're saying the same thing to our donors. So we're able to um, 
instill public trust and honor the intent of, of donors' wishes. Um, we are holding an all-fundraiser call, and so we'll, we'll set up a call for our fundraisers across the country and just go over um, with our chief development officer the, the top priorities and the strategy and the materials, um, which we're also helping to, to do. Um, as an additional bonus, we help set up national board call, or I'm sorry, national donor calls. Um, we usually do two. One is for our, um, we have a subset of fantastic donors um, in the corporate space called our annual disaster giving program donors. And those are who annually um, give to the Red Cross for disaster, uh, 500,000 or a million dollars. They're, they're fantastic. We'll also set up a separate conference call for the board members. And the purpose of these calls is just to give them a snapshot and highlights of um, how the Red Cross is responding and how much we appreciate their donations. And if additional ones are needed, um, we will uh, work with our, we'll pro provide the background information and then our relationship managers or fundraisers will go back to them after that call and make an additional request for, for funding or other sources. And then we also provide donor trips to see our operation in action. And we do that for, um, for a number of, we probably just do one or two because they're a very heavy lift. Um, the last time we did one was for the Louisiana floods. And we had our um, national chair of our board um, come, as well as a number of top donors. Um, and we, we really worked with them for about two-thirds of a day and showed them all the cool stuff we were doing and how we're helping others. It was a great experience. Whew. And then lots of updates, because there's always something new with the disaster. Um, so back to that kind of during the disaster response, what are our fundraisers doing? Um, they are making sure that whatever they're asking for, it's very clear to the donor. Um, I'll give you an example of this. So uh, we have, with the current disasters, we have a, a tornado operation in southern Georgia, um, a tornado operation in Mississippi, and another one in Alabama. We have a statewide fund open for Georgia and a statewide fund open for Mississippi. And let's say a donor comes and says, I want my money to stay in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, because that was one of the places that was impacted by tornadoes. And we would kindly say, well, thank you. We don't have a specific Hattiesburg fund set up, but we do have a Mississippi um, tornadoes fund. And this is helping with our Hattiesburg response. But you know, the tornado also impacted other um, areas outside the physical city of Hattiesburg. Our Red Cross volunteers and workers are, are crossing county lines and, and really making sure that everyone has the services they need. Um, are you OK with giving instead to Mississippi um, tornadoes? And usually the donor says, yeah, I understand. I, I totally get it. So that's, that's what I mean by the clear fundraising language and honoring donor intent. And then um, we've got pro progress again. My team works and tracks what's manually entered into Salesforce to have a whole national picture that we um, will present even to our CEO, Gail McGovern. Um, and we're able to track that progress daily through reports. And we can, again, shift our, um, our strategy as needed. Uh, a good example, again, recent. We ended up, um, we weren't planning on holding an all fundraiser call for this disaster because um, over the weekend because, you know, we were getting a, a good response. We knew our fundraisers in the impacted areas were doing a lot of work and um, holding telethons and raising what was needed. But we looked at our first report and the number of asks that were in the pipeline were not, um, were not as high as they should have been. And so my, my boss said, let's hold one of these calls. And we did. And um, the ask uh, doubled just in one day, the, the total amount that was being asked for. So things like that is, is how we help 
and how we monitor what's going on across the organization. Not sure if you have that, that ability to do that um, at, at a, that quick of a, a time frame, but you, but you may. Yeah. Excuse me, I had to get a sip of water. Um, and then we are, um, like I mentioned, during the disaster response, we are trying to manage those relationships. We are um, engaging our donors through either donor trips or observations locally. Um, so we might not set up a national donor tour, but um, once it is safe to do so and it's kind of the right timing, I can imagine our team in Georgia is going to, um, to work with a couple key, key donors and board members to make sure that they can go see our operation in action. Um, and then working on a campaign end date, which my boss would say we never really have an end date for a campaign, but we do kind of slow down and we may have to change strategy if we know that we have raised um, what we needed. We will go out and say we have what we need and um, work much more um, and shift to back to what we call blue sky or annual fundraising. All right, so I'm going to go into the specific segments now, which um, was going to be kind of the bulk of this presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk first about corporations and foundations. The Red Cross is very is different from the majority of other organizations, and it's because we receive um, more than of our private funding. We receive, I believe, more than 50% from corporations and around 30% from individuals, which it's normally flipped even more. Um, I believe it's 80-20, 80% 80, 80 individuals, 20% you know, other sources for a majority of organizations. So our corporate fundraising um, is strong. One of the reasons for that is that until about five, 10 years ago, the majority of our individual funding was had or was received through the United Way. And so we didn't necessarily have to interact as much with individuals to receive their, their individual donations because it would, have, it would kind of automatically come each year from United Way. And given the changes in United Way, we've had to kind of shift around. So we have a lot more attention being focused on our individual areas and we continue to kind of increase in that, that space and segment each year. Um, but we continue to have a strong, really great partnership. Um, so when disasters happen, we, um, with our companies, look to a couple different areas. Um, not only just a straight out donation, but we look at employee giving and workplace giving, um, engagement around that disaster, um, customer donation programs and cause marketing, and um, even in-kind donations. And we have a number of programs set up and ready to go so we can snap our fingers uh, and begin raising money through the companies in these areas. One is the online workplace giving campaign. We have what we call a microsite. And so the, we can go to the company and the company can put either on their intranet or even on their public um, servers a way to give to general disaster relief or the specific disaster. And um, in, in times of disaster, I believe for Matthew, we may have activated over 100 of these in different parts of the country. For a smaller disaster like the one we have now, we'll probably activate between 10 and 20. And by we, it's the fundraisers in the field. So it's been a, a great success for us. Um, In-kind donations are a bit uh, more cumbersome and complex. We typically try to, um, like most organizations, uh, and especially in the disaster space, uh, cash is absolutely um, the first thing needed and, and dollars in the door because with that we can purchase what's needed for um, those that are impacted. We know exactly what we need. We have a lot already in our warehouse ready to go. Um, whereas when in-kind donations come in, especially um, the very kind small boxes that can show up on the door um, of sweaters and, and clothing, 
or um, products that may be expired or partially opened, um, this is something that takes up a lot of extra time. We can't always give out. Um, and we also want to make sure that each of our clients receives equal service from us. And so when you have a bunch of small donations, we can't give it out um, to everyone. And we want to be able to spread it, kind of spread the wealth, um, and make sure that they're, they're given what, they're need, what they need and, and also what they're asking for. Um, so in general, we stay away from in-kind offers unless um, they, water is one uh, that we take and we ask for large pallets of water and it's even better when the company can or, or organization that wants to donate can come and drop it off themselves. Um, we look at snacks and, and bug spray and um, uh, we have a great partnership with Clorox. They give quite a bit of bleach um, to help to help our clients clean things up. Um, so we've got a, it, it's once in-kind donations start, it's kind of hard to stop or put on the, the, um, the pause button, but we do have good messaging as we try, and we work with our fundraisers to make sure that they're accepting the right in-kind donations that are requested by our disaster teams um, or not. And one note on international events, we actually do not accept international in-kind donations because of, the one, the amount it costs for us to ship. We have three warehouses located across the world that we pull supplies and culturally relevant supplies from, um, but very, very, very limited cases do we accept in-kind donations just because of um, the shipping, the time it takes to get from point A to B, and um, it, it's just, and the biggest thing too is that the country off asking for support is the one helping to coordinate those, um, those goods. And they're the ones that will eventually have to use or not use them. So uh, it's, we try to stay away from them then. All right, here's a list of at least some of our ADGP members, our annual disaster giving program members um, who are fantastic and we work, work with regularly in times of disaster. And they often always will set up their own workplace giving um, program or um, work with us in other ways to kind of help promote the importance of giving to the American Red Cross when, when a big event happens. On the individual side, uh, we work very hard to engage our boards when the disaster happens because they are often um, the face of the local community as well as the ones um, often helping us make ask to their, their peers and their support networks. Um, we have uh, some what we would call uh, affinity groups. One is called the Tiffany Circle, and so each many of our chapters have a group of women who give at a certain level each year, and the Tiffany Circle women um, in, in our regions really stand up when the disaster happens to not only um, help us raise additional funds, but promote the good work that we're doing. So we manage this in, in, in a bit of a different way than our, our corporations um, with the altru altruistic factors and value-based giving and, and making sure that our individuals understand um, how, they can, how they can help and how their donation is meaningful. Um, we also have a celebrity team that works with um, individual celebrities, mainly on the social space now, um, in, in terms of their giving capacity, uh, and then working with talent agencies um, and, and reaching out to ones that have affinities for certain geographies when the disaster happens too. So that's a neat, a neat aspect. Um, on the consumer fundraising space, that core donor space, usually when a big disaster happens, we um, work pretty quickly to get an email out. Um, we have direct mail, and typically the cost benefit of now sending out direct mail um, isn't worth it unless a huge, huge event happens and then we see a, a great ROI. We do a lot on social media. Um, we'll put a button up quite often on our redcross.org website 
and we'll activate our text to give. Um, and then our peer-to-peer -peer, uh, area is, is CrowdRise. Um, we also see our funding pop up on Network for Good and other spaces like that when a big event happens. So we're ready to go on those. And just a little more on email and mail. Um, our recommendation is email should be sent out within 24 hours of the disaster. And if you do choose to send an additional direct mail piece, it should be sent out within 48 hours of the event happening. Because the quicker it gets in someone's in inbox or mailbox when the uh, attention and the mission is at hand, the better results you'll see. We always have our text Red Cross to 90999 available, and we will just um, advertise it more and use it more when um, a disaster happens. And then when larger events happen, we will set up a new keyword for text to give. Right now our keyword is text tornado to 90999 to make a donation. Um, we try with our fundraisers, especially our, our major gift um, uh, relationship managers and fundraisers to kind of use this as a back pocket, but they should be going and, and either having a personal conversation over the phone um, or, a, or in person um, and asking for a larger gift than automatically just sending out a message that says, oh, by the way, give, you can give $10 to the Red Cross. Um, this is more for our our everyday um, and fantastic core donors who give at a, a lower level, um, as well as for others just to use, to share, and um, the donations absolutely help us when that disaster happens. Uh, telethons, we usually hold them in the impacted areas because it's a great way to raise awareness and raise funding, but we do evaluate them and we ask our regional chapters to evaluate whether or not the ROI is there because um, a telethon just takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of volunteers. Um, it takes a lot of time, uh, especially at a time when there's heightened activity going on. Um, so we ask our folks to evaluate. And usually they, they move forward and hold one because they want to make sure that um, that our name is out there. And, and plus they are fun once you start running them. But it, it does take a lot of time. And then we'll hold national ones if requested by a large network um, when a huge disaster happens. Um, during the floods in Louisiana this past summer, we um, worked with Raycom Media and we held a multi-state telethon. It wasn't a national one like the one we did during Hurricane Sandy. Um, but that was, that was successful and it was a great opportunity for us. Um, but it did raise, uh, it, it was very time consuming on at least I would say 30 of our staff um, at national headquarters and in the field to, to take on. And the cost benefit was eventually there, um, but not in the same capacity of our NBC telethon during Hurricane Sandy, which was a fantastic success and raised millions of dollars and happened very quickly. Um, so just a, just a couple examples. And now kind of the last part of the presentation, and thanks for listening to me, um, around donor stewardship and maintaining and ensuring that trust with the donors um, and continuing as we can to build those relationships enable, and enable that annual support for the organization. Um, we work on this by uh, providing three months, six months, and one year reports for specific large events and work internally here to produce those. Um, we incorporate some of those new donors um, into the annual fundraising plans and the portfolios of our, of our relationship managers and fundraisers. And then um, sometimes we'll, we'll hold events and thank you events. We use our volunteers. There are a number of ways to continue, continue to engage that donor following the event um, and get them to either learn more about how we're still helping those um, donors after a disaster, or I'm sorry, the clients and, and the people that we're serving after the disaster, or, um, or managing uh, around what 
what we're doing in the stewardship space to talk about our other programs so that they get to see and, and feel how the Red Cross um, is helping either in their community um, across the country or around the world. And just an example of one, um, one company or, or one donor that started as episodic and then kind of branched out um, nationwide insurance. They gave a response to a large event years ago, and we were able to talk them into joining that um, our, our annual disaster giving program um, because they wanted to help not only for for that event, but for future events to come and help us be ready so that we had the funding we needed before that disaster happened. Um, and then we expanded, and, and now they're hosting blood drives for us. Um, some of their employees are taking our first aid and CPR courses. They're helping to fund blood mobiles now in, in some of our communities. Um, some of their management serving as board members. So this is a great example of a way that we're able to broaden, um, broaden that gift and, and make it sustaining. Uh, all right, that is it, you all. That's the um, thank you for listening and, and joining in. And now would love to take your questions. I already see one from Miranda. Um, are there any specific strategies you use to expand our donor base that you think would work well at the small local level? I guess there are, let me think, there are, there are a couple. The, the main strategy is just to, one, make sure, and this sounds so simple, but in every, everyone's busy life, um, we ask our, our fundraisers to come up with stewardship and move management plans for um, specific donors um, after they've given to an event. So how are you going to follow up? What's your timetable? And have them place it into our Salesforce platform so that they won't forget, oh, I need to follow up with Mrs. Jones who made that wonderful $5,000 contribution to the Louisiana floods. She hasn't given in um, maybe three years, and the event inspired her to give. So I know that um, at month one, I'm going to give her a call and see if she wants to meet with one of our volunteers who deployed to the Louisiana operation and, and get some firsthand um, and learn firsthand how that volunteer um, experienced or, or really about that volunteer's experience. And then at the three-month mark, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to mail her one of our, our stewardship reports and give her a call, follow up, see if she has any questions. Um, and then, you know, at the six-month mark, we've got that event coming up, and I'm going to see if she wants to go to it, et cetera. So I think simple things like that, Miranda, does that answer your question? Great. Are there any other questions? I know I gave a lot of information to you, but we're a, a big organization and pretty complex. So I hope this was helpful for you all. Ellen, this is Jessica here. Um, I, I do want to say thank you for um, helping us all understand a little bit more about some of the, the structures at the Red Cross. Um, because as you said, you are a very large organization. Um, our groups are um, you know, much more regionally based and working with a, a smaller donor base as a result. But I think a lot of the principles apply. And um, certainly considering uh, not only how to fundraise for a response, but also to, to help support some of the preparedness efforts that these groups undertake and how to uh, build more people into the, the fundraising part of that work is um, definitely central. So Miranda has a, a couple of other follow-ups. Um, what about approaching donors who have never given any helpful starting points? Uh, obviously, Ellen, you have a name brand recognition that is uh, very helpful, but do you have any other insights on um, how do you begin that conversation? Um, again, it depends on, on the type of, of donor, um, but the, the best way I've, I've seen is that luckily during a disaster, we have the ability to cold call. Um, and be relevant, and so cold calls can work. You know, when you're you're front and center, 
Um, but really, the best way would be, can you get an introduction from somebody who knows you as well as, and knows your organization um, as well as who knows this person? Um, because that personal touch is, is always the best, and they'll, they'll take your phone call or tend to take your email. Um, and just having that, when you're able to get that meeting, having that discussion. Um, we do a lot of, of prospecting and research as well um, around uh, disaster giving, and I know our fundraisers have a number of prospects um, that they will call based on either the type of disaster or, um, or, or uh, some other affinity, uh, such as we have a list of alumni from um, from certain areas that we'll pull. Right now, I would imagine we would pull, and, and I don't know the university in in and around Hattiesburg. Um, oh, actually, there was a college that was directly impacted. And we would look and see across the country, um, do we have any, any um, current donors or lapsed donors um, who are, are alums? And we could reach out to, even though they're in the Washington, D.C. area now. That's another way. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and I did want to, if, if it's not possible, um, to um, enable Miranda Nixon's microphone, because she is someone who's been involved with an Alliance for a Response group in Pittsburgh that um, had a very successful um, fundraising effort to uh, receive um, a group grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to fund their supply cash. So Miranda, are you able to speak in your microphone? I tried to um, enable your microphone rights. Mm -hmm. um, I can barely hear you. Can you turn up your microphone at all? Um, let me see if I can. You sound a little bit louder. Do you want to, are you able okay. to, to speak gonna... a little bit about that? Yeah, I can do that. I'm just going to hold it really close to my mouth. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, Miranda Nixon, I'm with the Alliance for Response Pittsburgh chapter. And um, as with many of our, uh, our groups, we have trouble with fundraising, you know, trying to either get programming off the ground that we would like or just extra resources. And um, for us, this NEH Preservation Assistance Grant was a, a big help for one of our projects that we now have. Um, on hand to help anyone who um, needs uh, these disaster supplies. So our group started back in 2008, and um, I think the idea for this shared disaster supply cash came up pretty quickly, um, probably through Tom Clarison with Lyricist, but, um, but I can't remember now who actually suggested it. But um, we started looking into grant funding opportunities, and this preservation assistance grant for smaller institutions was really the best fit for what we needed. We um, we applied. Thankfully, in, in 2010, we received the maximum amount of $6,000. And we were able to put together a large shared disaster cache and provide a training workshop to go along with that. Um, the tricky parts of the grant for us were that we had to be registered as a US nonprofit organization. And we were not then, and we are not now. And so we had to find a way around that. Um, thankfully, Pittsburgh is pretty, um, there are many, many cultural heritage institutions around Pittsburgh. So um, we partnered up with a few different groups in order to apply for the grant and to think about the long-term storage of this supply cache and, and what we were gonna do with it. So um, we partnered up with the Pennsylvania Academic Library Consortium Incorporated, which is Palsy for short, um, since they are a 501c and um, we had several very active um, staff members from them in our initial AFR group. And so then we at least had a way to submit the application and we had project directors that could work directly with NEH for the distribution of the funds and making sure that we were executing it correctly. Um, but then in terms of what were we going to do with these materials? You know, we're, we're a group, but we're representative of the emergency managers that are in Pittsburgh and around, um, around the county, as well as, you know, several organizations that were big names or universities, but then a lot of smaller groups. 
and we didn't have extra funds to either rent a location or, you know, even if we'd come up with money for maybe a year or two, then what do we do? So we also teamed up with the University of Pittsburgh's um, university library system, which is actually also where I work. And um, we have space offsite for us where we can host the supplies long term. Um, we were able to provide space for the training workshop. And then um, it was a lot easier to figure out our access strategy. So we had to also devise um, or write up uh, an agreement. Um, how were we going to stipulate that people would be able to use these disaster supply materials whenever they had something happen that they couldn't cover themselves? But then also we had to figure out they're going to have to um, replenish these materials. We can't just have them go away when someone uses them and then we're done. Um, we want something that can be ongoing for all of our community members. So we had to write a lengthy agreement, which um, our partners had to sign off on. So Palsy had to be OK with it, and the University of Pittsburgh had to be OK with it, as well as the Steering Committee for Alliance for Response. Um, and once we agreed on what the terms would be, then we had to reach out to our members. And those who were interested in signing this memorandum um, for use would then have to have it approved by the appropriate person in their organization and sign off on it. And so within the agreement, then we had to also come up with, well, how are people going to access these materials, especially when it's always on a Friday evening or weekend or a holiday? Um, and so I think the University of Pittsburgh was best placed to have someone and staff on hand that could very quickly gain access versus a potential offsite storage facility where there is no there are no people present or anything like that. Um, that has been a successful project for us. We were very thankful that we got the grant and that we were able to work with two large organizations to make it work. Um, but since then, further fundraising has still been very difficult. Um, programs, we try to aim at something that is free for all of our members. Certainly, there's a lot of reasons why um, attendance can be difficult for anyone, whether that's geographic location or they don't have the staff to cover um, them, them leaving you know, their institution. But also, we, we like the idea of exploring perhaps trainings where attendees might have to pay a very small fee. But we really, you know, also sort of rebel against that idea because we, we don't want another obstacle to meeting attendance. So for us, we constantly try to look at further partnerships. Are there local vendors maybe that we can ask for sponsorship for some training or just for meeting space or to pay for the presenter or just meeting refreshments or something like that? So um, working with local vendors and organizations has become our new way of, of trying to look at fundraising opportunities, which is why I was um, asking the questions that I did. Thank you, Ellen, for your presentation. Um, and we did, I think that's the AFR New York City group that has achieved 501c3 status after Hurricane Sandy. And we last year actually looked into this. Um, we were in contact with them to find out what would be entailed in this. Would that actually give us better opportunities to um, apply for grants on our own without having to have these partnerships. Um, but really the feedback that we got was that don't attempt it, it's extremely problematic. So we've had to look in, into other directions to try to make these programs and trainings work. So. Great, thank you for those insights, Miranda. Um, it's really helpful. Um, and I, I see that we've had another question come in um, from Carl in New Jersey. Um, Noting that you know many individual and corporate donors who already support specific cultural institutions, uh, they're accustomed to helping those institutions meet their mission, program, and even cap capital uh, facility goals. So then asking those same donors to contribute towards disaster preparation and planning efforts of the Alliance for Response groups in those regions, uh, which are essentially collectives, um, it might be a, um, a hard sell. So how would you think about making a compelling case to such donors to make additional contributions towards a collective effort? Um, you know, I, I, I'd be curious to hear um, how Ellen might con uh, address this question. And, and uh, likewise, if 
um, Miranda has any insights to contribute. But um, I would say that, you know, this is one of the, the big questions for the Alliance for Response Initiative because we're not just individual institutions that are, are trying to make these connections. It's, it's these broader collectives. So um, whereas, um, you know, it's, it's easier to stay on the radar of corporations and individual donors when you have um, the kind of institutional presence that a, a large museum in the area or a library might have. Um, making sure that people are aware of the existence of Alliance for Response groups, I think is probably going to be a first step in just, um, you know, the, the public awareness piece of it. Uh, again, the American Red Cross is such a, a well-known name that um, people don't turn to them in disasters um, because they are able to, to do so much good to help. Um, so, you know, I think that, in, in my opinion, perhaps one of the first steps we need to do is to just um, all individual AFRs and, and then here at FAIC to, to try and raise the banner more for what the, the overall initiative is trying to do and what these groups are able to provide in terms of assistance following events. Does anyone have anything else to contribute to that? This is Ellen. I'll go. Um, I, I absolutely agree. Making um, making them aware first and, and educating. Um, but one thing we have to do quite often is, uh, again, people want to give to that specific disaster and not necessarily our broader mission, even if we do have the name recognition. And so we have to um, come up with ways to make it to ensure that they know how their donation is helping at the local level and um, and give examples of how how we can their donation will help um, even even if it's a broader mission um, how that will that will tie back and help them locally so I think building the case for that is important as well Marantha, did you have something you wanted to chime in with? Um, I do. I, I think for me, I also see a great value in trying to work with the um, cultural institutions very closely on this and trying to get them to understand um, the value of our organizations, you know, especially if they don't have anyone who regularly attends our meetings, because I see an in in terms of, um, you know, they have their their mission, program, whatever their own goals are. If they can start to work in the idea of disaster preparation, any planning, and then perhaps work AFR into that, I think that maybe instead of working with the donors from two different sides of it, it would make more sense to work with them from just the side of the cultural heritage institution and that seeing if we can form a partnership that way so that if funds are getting donated to those organizations, maybe some amount of it, I mean, not that I feel like this is likely, <laughs> but maybe some of that could be set aside to, um, you know, to, to work with AFR for other disaster planning or, or something on that front. Um, I know that just within our own organization uh, at Pitt, you know, that's that's one way that, in terms of preservation, we try to get people to, to look at, well, we, we get donations, you know, to our archives or special collections, what, what have you. Um, and when they ask for monetary donations, I try to get them to think about, well, there's also the preservation aspect, which doesn't really get mentioned to the donor, but that that, that costs money. So um, I think that maybe approaching it from that side could also be beneficial and trying to make partnerships on that side instead of us both trying to come at the donor from different sides, you know, that, where they're not seeing that, oh, well, I might be bombarded, but it's really for the same cause. I think that's a great point to really be more collaborative in those efforts from the start. Um, we had another question come in from Carl saying um, that he noticed that some of American Red Cross's corporate donors like Walmart, Lowe's, even Dell, all can match their business products and services to the disaster response programs of American Red Cross. Um, AFRs probably need to do something similar such, since such corporate donors might be more interested in helping a collective and supporting individual cultural institutions. So that's an interesting thought, certainly. Um. Um, yeah, so actually some of the vendors that we tend to have sponsor um, some of our meetings or where we've um, held our meeting at their facility, those have been um, vendors that supply disaster response services. 
um, or who um, we've had construction companies who have approached us because they deal with disaster restoration and restoration of historic properties. So um, those are companies that maybe we wouldn't have thought of before, but they've been great resources for us. Great. Yeah, well, to that end, we have um, the the win win. We have a number of insurance companies, as you saw on that list, um, and, and others that are much easier to build partnerships with than than someone who may a, a company that just doesn't have the affinity or or, um, or or really, I guess, have their employees and and others. Um, be directly impacted by by events and their products help with them. So true. Great. Well, I don't see um, any other questions coming in at this point. Um, and I, I just want to um, kind of summarize again that, you know, uh, a lot of these groups are certainly working on a much smaller scale, but, um, you know, I think so many of the principles that Ellen outlined for us um, are, are certainly applicable and I think um, in particular you know I was encouraged to see that we all I think um, when we think of the Red Cross we think of response and recovery activities but to see such a, a big focus on um, the preparation side and the fact that you all are able to um, get support for that and kind of build it into your overall culture of giving as well I think is a really encouraging example for everyone in the Alliance for Response groups to consider as well. So um, I, I hope that everyone else found um, this content to be as, as fascinating and as useful as I did. Uh, so I wanted to say thank you again to Ellen and, and of course thank you to Miranda for jumping in and sharing some of your experiences here as well. Um, so uh, Ellen has very generously provided her uh, email address here. Um, so if people have other final questions that come up or things that uh, you think of after the fact, um, thank you for sharing that, Ellen. I'm sure everyone appreciates it. Um, so I just want to go ahead and um, wrap up today's session as well as the, the whole Alliance for Response webinar series that we've put together um, and just thank everyone who's on the program today and um, thank everyone who was able to join in for other sessions as well. And, remind everyone to tune in to the, the YouTube channel for the, the whole six programs in the series. I'm going to go ahead and pull over a survey link for today's webinar and uh, again ask you all to just take a few moments to fill out a brief 10 question survey. Um, in particular we'd love to get your input on the last question here which might be topics for future webinar programming. Um, this is the last session of um, this six series program, but we do have a few more webinars in the works for later this year and into next year as well, um, again for the Alliance for Response community. So if there's other topics that you've been inspired to learn a little bit more about, please do identify those for us. And um, again, I, I want to give a, a big shout out um, to our wonderful presenter, Ellen Gorham. We're, we're so grateful to you, Ellen, for taking the time to educate us all today. So thank you. And um, of course, we're so grateful to the National Endowment for the Humanities for making this whole series possible. So thanks to everyone, and um, we will hopefully see you all back for the, the next round of webinars when they take place later in the year. Thank you, everyone.